What are my New Year's resolutions? To lose weight. Giving up caffeine. No smoking cigarettes. Getting a new job. Getting more in track with budget. Maybe be more considerate of others. Take better care of myself. Spend less money. Do a better job taking care of my family. Drink less coffee. Go with the flow, I guess. Probably try to be a, a better Christian. So every year I usually resolve to make some, but then I don't. Well, I'm so old, I don't make them anymore. I don't even know where the concept came from for making resolutions. This seems kind of pointless. Can't break them if you don't make them. I think it's a new beginning. I think a lot of it helps us to look at centering ourselves again. If you want to change something, you just change it whenever. I mean, putting a date on it, I don't know if that really helps it. Maybe the resolution just sets a direction. Usually New Year's resolutions are probably only thought up in probably about a week. That's about two months, you just kind of give up on them. I've just ne never really said any that really meant enough to me. I guess I didn't have the will to finish them. I think mostly it's like you just kind of forget and you have other things to do. It's just something that you know you're never going to achieve and so you set it as your New Year's resolution so you're not obligated to do it. I guess I really haven't had anything which is like important enough to me to or like actually stick to it. I think we just get bored easily. You stick to it for about two weeks and then life happens. Well, good morning. Welcome to Kingsland Baptist Church. I hope that by the end of this day, just maybe, you will have decided on a New Year's resolution if you haven't already. If you already made a New Year's resolution, raise your hand. Let's see who's done that. Good job. I haven't, but I'm hoping by the end of the day I might. And uh, we are so thankful that you have decided to come and worship with us here at Kingsland today. We have a, a, just a number of really interesting and special things we're doing today. And uh, right up front, uh, the Lord in the year 2010 uh, chose to just babies here at Kingsland. And it's been a great year in that regard. And um, we have uh, uh, James and Rebecca Blake who are going to come forward with their daughter and their son Cam, who we de dedicated a little while ago. But uh, today we're going to dedicate Reagan Elizabeth Blake. And um, let me first of all give you this nice little certificate in this cute little pink Bible. Becca and uh, Becca and James came up in my youth ministry when I was a youth pastor here at Kingsland uh, years and years ago. And uh, now they've been married. They have a growing family. And uh, they're part of a bigger family within the church. And we're very, very thankful for them. You remember the story in the Bible when Samuel, um, when his mother Hannah begged for God to give him, give her a son. And he did. And she dedicated him back to the Lord. And we use that kind of as an example for why we dedicate our children. And um, we are really, to be honest with you, we're dedicating James and Rebecca. Because they're the, the ones that are going to make the choices right now to bring their children up in a godly home. In a, in a home where the Word of God is taught, where their kids are in church, and where they're following the Lord. I want to remind you of a, a very special verse from the book of Deuteronomy. That... Um, Chapter 6, verse 4, that says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And, um, and, and, and these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You see, your kids know your heart. Your kids know what you really are. Your kids see you day in, day out, when you stub your toe, when, 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 you, when you can't pay a bill, when, you, when things don't go the way you want them to, when you... When you they see you. They know who you really are. And we should love the Lord our God as, as parents, as grandparents, as an example to the next generation. They should see the love of Christ in our lives and want that. We should give them an appetite for the things of God. Think about the things we give our kids an appetite for. Hopefully not too many you know, happy meals and, 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 and all this, the junk. What are we giving our kids appetites for? The, the Word of God says this. These words I command you shall be on your heart and in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk about them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And, and, and the, the people of Israel took that literally. They did those things literally. And we, and we know that the principle today is the same. All these years later, that the word of God it's our obligation to teach our children, to train our children, and to model it, not just with our, with our words, but with our lives. And, and when they see our heart, that they see a heart that loves the Lord more than anything else. 
And today, I want to ask you, James and Rebecca, will you dedicate yourself to bringing Reagan up in that kind of home? Yes. Fantastic. Kingsland Baptist Church, will you dedicate yourself to giving more than ever, sacrificing more than ever, bending over backwards more than ever, ever to make the necessary changes and to make the necessary commitment and sacrifices to reach Reagan and all these babies that are coming up in our, in our church? Will you make that commitment? Say amen, if you will. Amen. Would you pray with me as we dedicate this beautiful little girl? Lord God, I thank you for James. I thank you for Rebecca. Thank you for Cam. And today we are so thankful that you gave them Reagan Elizabeth. We're so thankful that she's healthy, beautiful, happy, just a perfectly normal, healthy uh, delivery and, 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 and life that you've, you've given this to them and this family. Lord, I pray that you'd bless Sandy and all of the family that are here in our church. And we as a church family, as we endeavor to, to give them the strength and the help that they need to, to bring her up in a godly environment. Lord, I pray that, that we would dedicate ourselves, and we do dedicate ourselves to be a church that is all about reaching these beautiful little babies, that we would be the adults, that we would be the parents and the grandparents, and even some great-grandparents who will serve and sacrifice and stand and be faithful and give and pour into the lives of our children. And Lord, we dedicate Reagan to you and we, and, and we dedicate James and Rebecca as they dedicate themselves to being godly parents and bring her up in a godly home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good job. Thank you. Would you stand with me? I want to encourage you this morning to sing out, to give praise to our God as we, as we enter into a brand new year. Let's claim that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Let's, let's embrace that victory that he wants each and every one of us to have. God, I pray that you would be pleased with our worship. We pray that you would give us victory, that you would give us everything that you have for us, that we would claim it, that we would live it, that we would walk it, and that you would be pleased as we worship you today. In Christ's name we pray.
Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is so I'm your IMB missionary to the Mapuche people in Temuco, Chile, along with my wife Angel and my family. We live in Temuco, and I want to thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the cooperative program and the Lonnie Moon Christmas offering. We went to bed on uh, February 26th with everything normal, and we got shook out of bed early morning on the 27th by the fifth largest earthquake recorded in, ever recorded. And I want to thank you because of your faithfulness and your giving. Almost immediately, we were able to go out 
and uh, start delivering food, medical supplies, and clean water and assessing the damage and finding areas that needed help. Most of you will never be on one of these airplanes flying to these strange places in the world where we live. But because of your giving, Southern Baptists are able to be there and be prepared and ready, not just for the day-to-day -day sharing of Jesus Christ, but at times when major disasters happen, we're ready to respond. And it's because of your faithfulness to giving to the Crawford program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that makes all that possible. You know, it may not seem important when you give, but to many people in the world, that gift that you give can literally be the difference between life and death. And I just want to say thank you and God bless. Just a quick reminder, uh, today's the last day to get your Lottie Moon offering in. We haven't quite met our goal, but uh, uh, we still can do that. So uh, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, time that we've had to study your word this morning in fellowship. And uh, Lord, we come to you now with these tithes and offerings. We pray that you would uh, multiply them and, and use them to grow your kingdom around this world. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless the missionaries that serve all over this world, that you would uh, help them to have a wonderful and a productive year. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with each one of us, guide and direct us this year. And uh, just use us to grow your kingdom as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
over the next few weeks, we are starting the year 2011 with a bang. We've got a lot going on in our church. Next weekend, we start our Caritas Outreach to the Homeless, where they will be living in our facilities. Christine King is someone you want to talk to about signing up to help. And uh, the weekend after that, we're starting our Truth Project. And this is designed to in, help our folks develop a stronger biblical worldview. We do a lot of things at Kingsland to reach our community. We just finished Operation Chesterfield just a couple months ago, and we'll start another one in April. But what we wanted to do was take everything and point back inward and see how we're doing, see how we can get stronger when it comes to things like who is God, who is man, what is the word of God, what is a biblical worldview. We're going to show you a four or five minute long video here that helps you know a little bit more about the Truth Project. You've been given an opportunity to sign up this morning at Bible study, and uh, there's also sign-ups in the foyer. And if you want, just take the little attachment thing on your bulletin, sign up on that, and give it to me before you leave. And uh, we will, we'll get you in, in one of the homes. It's really a two-fold purpose with Truth Project. Is Number one, the biblical worldview side of it and, and growing wiser and, and godlier and having a, going deeper. But it's also the idea of just getting together with Christian family and getting to know people you may not know and getting in each other's homes and, and spending time together and being family. So that, that's what we're doing starting on January 16th at 6.30. And um, you can sign up for that in the back. You can sign up on the bulletin. Just get that to me. And right now, I want you to get a little more informed about what it is. about to take what could well be the most important tour of your life. It's going to be a worldview tour. We are going to turn and gaze upon the face of God. What should we hear? What should we see? You are going to be amazed. Why did Jesus come into the world? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know? From time to time, we're going to bring some experts into the classroom. The world is reeling with uncertainty. It's almost like it's in the air. Truth is fundamentally about who God is. We're challenged to either confront culture, to abandon it, or transform it. Is our culture filled with lies? This is a battle of worldviews. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Evil. What is it? Where did it come from? Why is it in the world? Who is God? Who is God? Who is man? What does God say about who man is? What takes us captive? What is insanity? What is the world's view of work? God is a God of social order. We're going to look at economic, art, media, music, and literature in this sphere of labor. We're going to look at the area of philosophy and ethics. Everything is about relationships. There is no direction you can travel in which God has not spoken. I want us to look at the answers that we get from both Christians and non-Christians. We get over 250,000 letters and phone calls at Focus every month. And if you were to listen in on some of those, it would make your heart break. The body of Christ has so bought the lies of the world that we have not only conformed to the world, but we are suffering deeply from the consequences of believing those lies. We have become convinced that the only long-term solution to this problem is to rebuild those foundations, to build again that comprehensive biblical worldview within God's people. One of the effects of a comprehensive and systematic biblical worldview is that you're not as easy to fool. The effect we want to see upon people's lives is that they have that ability to discern and to be able to fend off uh, those lies and the illusions uh, that bombard them from every quarter of life.
So we are deeply concerned about taking part in an effort that will not just treat the symptoms, but will go to the root of this problem, which is a worldview problem. The vision of the Truth Project, uh, first and foremost, is that God will perform a deep transformation within the lives of those people who go through the study. It's a transformation that will radically change the way they view the world and the way they live their life. It's a change that is permanent. It's not an emotional experience. How does it happen? Well, for sure we know that it doesn't happen because of anything we do. That kind of a transformation only occurs when God does His work within the heart and mind of an individual. And that is why uh, this whole project is going to be resting on a platform of prayer. Because we recognize that what we seek here doesn't simply come because we got a really neat product. It comes because of the work of God. It is a long time coming, a project such as the Truth Project. I think that the Truth Project is one of the most significant things that Focus on the Family has ever undertaken. Of all the issues today, you could boil them down to half a dozen, but unquestionably, truth would be major. The question of truth and training minds in how to approach truth is of importance that cannot be gainsaid. What is the definition of the present? This is what's happening, huh? Right now. What is the meaning and purpose of life? This is where the battle rages. I guess in the end what we're really after is that we will see God's people hunger for Him. That they will continually be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. And what that means is when He weeps, we weep. What He calls evil, we see as evil. What He calls glorious and good, we see as glorious and good. And if I do exist, why do I exist? If I think I exist, where did that thought come from? We're going to build the final pillar history. We're going to look at the American experiment. Intimacy, union, communion, fellowship, love. The God of the universe dwells within me? Wow. families, especially little boys and girls, in our Truth Project. These are three vital, vital attempts that all get started in the next 14 days or so, where we are attempting to impact this world for Christ, whether it be reaching families through basketball and cheerleading whether it be reaching the neediest of the needy, the homeless, and quite frankly, reaching people in our church, many of which do not yet have a firm, solid grasp of what it is to have a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. Would you pray about that with me? Lord God, I pray that you'd bless. I pray that you would guide. I pray that you would pour yourself out on Kingsland moving into 2011. I pray that you would take all of the various things we're trying to do and make something very special out of it. None of them have come because of uh, some, some uh, tradition or some adherence to uh, man's ideas or anything like that. Lord, we have prayed about these things and we believe that you have led us in this direction to go into our another season of upward to yet again bring the homeless into our, our facilities and minister to them. And to try something new in the homes of, of people here in our church. Lord, I pray that you would richly bless each one for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to look at quite a few verses in this, in this chapter today. Unfortunately, we will not be able to, to dissect and, and get deeply into any of, of them. But you may have noticed over the last month or so that there's a lot of uh, people in our church, uh, mostly crazy people, um, wearing this, this, this gray uh, shirt, this t-shirt. Uh, I actually wore it once and have worn it a lot since. I love that shirt. It fits good. It feels good. But, um, but, but some might have it on today. Um, I see there's Bill. He's got his. And, it, and, and it's the Are We There Yet shirt. It's the Unreached People Group shirt that, 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 that we went in the, 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 the international offering all, all December that we really, we really asked that question. Are we there yet? You saw it on the video today. It's on, it's on a board outside. Are we there yet? And it, and it was said so many times and it just got in my head. And I thought, you know, I've got to talk about this. Are we there yet? You know, and, 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 and the person praying and talking about it pretty much every week, I think the consensus was the same. You know, are we there yet? Well, um, Philippians chapter 3 is, is, is chock full of goodies. And, 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 and really, just to give you an idea of what we're going to do in the next few minutes is it, we're going to look ahead some. But, but, and, and you can ask Elizabeth, I, I'm a reminiscer. I like to reminisce. I like to look back. I like to think. And, and, and if I'm not careful, I'll get stuck looking in the rearview mirror. You know? Even driving down the road. You gotta look in the rearview mirror once in a while, but you don't want to get stuck in the rearview And I'm not talking about to put on makeup and look at yourself. To look behind you. The reason you have a rearview mirror. To see what's going on behind you before you make a lane change or things like that. And so today we're gonna look in our rearview mirror back in 2010. We're going to look in our, ahead to 2011. We're going to talk about some really good things. And we're going to start by talking about some bad things. But um, ask yourself the question, are we there yet? Paul, actually, in writing this text through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, answers it on his behalf. And you'll see that. Look at verse 7. The things which were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul has just talked about what a, an, you know, an amazing career he had. He was a snappy dresser. He was a, a well-paid, well-respected Pharisee of Pharisees back in the day when he was Saul. But then he got blinded by the light on the road to Damascus and everything changed and he got born again. He got saved. And the same person he had, he had, that he had persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, he now was, was part of. Everything changed in his life. And the things he used to think were great, he looked at them as, as, as garbage. Verse 8, Yet I, indeed, I also count all these things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish that I may gain Christ. He lost it all. He was a, a, a first century success story. But then he lost it all. And he didn't lose it because he went bankrupt or someone took it from him. He walked away from it. I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. And how many of us have finally come to the point where we realize our own righteousness could never get it done? Whoever you are, wherever you are, however old you are, your righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what the prophet Isaiah told us. We're not righteous enough. We don't have what it takes to be righteous. We're just not righteous. We may be self-righteous and think we're righteous, but what Paul realized is that all his righteous stuff was garbage and it didn't mean squat with God. And he needed to have righteousness imputed, uh, 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 delivered, put into his account through, through a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. This is what his life's all about now. Verse 10, that I may know him, Jesus, in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Which is not saying, oh, I hope I get to be resurrected in the sense of I might, I may, I may not. It's, I can't wait. I can't wait to be done with this life and in, and in the arms of Jesus and walking on the streets of gold and seeing him face to face, knowing him personally like that. In verse 12, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example. Can you say that, by the way? Can you tell the guys at work, brethren, follow my example? As a parent, that's what you should be saying. That's what Becca and James said today. Cam, Reagan, follow my example. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That's what our, our church leaders are saying. That's what our Sunday school teachers and our deacons are saying. Our staff. Ladies and gentlemen, follow my example. Ooh, man, that's scary. I have a hard time even saying that because I know how bad I blow it sometimes. But that's what the Apostle Paul says here. Brethren, join the following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who have set their mind on earthly things. But our citizenship is where, ladies and gentlemen? It's in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it will be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is, even, is able to subdue all things to Himself. Look at the first verse of chapter 4. Therefore, my beloved, and long for, brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord. So let's ask the question again. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, God richly blessed us again in the year 2010. God blessed our socks off. I believe he's just getting started. We drove in this morning, the kids and I, uh, me and uh, Alyssa and David, uh, driving in, listening to that song, Greater Things Have Yet to Come. Greater things have yet to come. God of the city. And man, I believe that. Greater things are going to come. God has a God-sized plan for Kingsland Baptist Church in 2011 that only He can make accomplish. Only He can make happen. Only He can accomplish it in His strength and in through our lives. Are we there yet? On the way to Winston-Salem, last, I guess last week going to Christmas with the grand, grandparents, we were barely out of Petersburg. And all of a sudden, are we there yet? Are we almost there? I'm hearing that in the background. I'm thinking, no, we're not even close to there yet. Elizabeth and I celebrated yesterday our 11th um, New Year's Day in Richmond, Virginia, at Kingsland Baptist Church. And, and I just think back to 11 years ago. And Where did we think we would be 11 years from now? And where do we think the church would be by now? And are, are we where we thought we'd be as a ministry? Are we there yet? Where does God expect us to be? Where does He want us to go? Where does He want to take us? How about that? That's a better way to say it. Where does God want to lift us up and take us in the coming year? As a church, as a Christian community, are we there yet? Are we? Let's get negative for just a minute. And I've already preached this sermon to my wife, not really, but, but I told her what I was going to talk about, and she said, well, you might want to shave down the negatives. So I, this is a shaved down version of what you were originally going to get. Are we there yet? There are still empty seats in our church most Sundays. Not many today, but a few. Are we there yet? There are still more people at the flea market on Sunday morning than here in worship. Are we there yet? There are ten thousands, or I guess tens of thousands of people in Richmond who are lost. Hundreds of thousands of people in Metro Richmond who are not in church this morning. They're unchurched. Meanwhile, the baptismal pool is empty most Sunday mornings in most churches. Even at Kingsland, many churches fight more about trivial matters than they fight the real enemy, Satan, and those who oppose Christ. Look back at verse 18 and 19. Let's take a, a, quick, a quick diversion from the negative list. It says, Many walk, whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that these are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. They are earthlings. They are, they are all about their appetites. Listen, we have an enemy. Satan is our enemy. And he has those in his camp that, are, that would just love to put us out of business, shut us down, and, and we love them. We love people even if they are working for the enemy. Let me just tell you, that's the enemy. Your Christian brother and sister should not be the enemy. The divorce rate in the average church in America is the same as in society. Many churches are more concerned with appeasing members than reaching the lost. Precious few churches are willing to make the changes and sacrifices necessary to reach people in their community today. 
So you have this, this kind of this dichotomy. Some churches are consumed with being hip instead of being holy. Then you have other churches that are consumed with tradition instead of the Word of God. They, they believe that the tradition equals the Word of God, that their traditions are the same as the Bible. They put them up on the same plane. plane. Most Christians can't remember the last time they shared the gospel with another person. And there are 6,426 unreached people groups across the planet. And I'm sure you've noticed the t-shirts. Thank you, Bill, for modeling yours. Our Southern Baptist Convention, thank God, 10,000, more than 10,000 missionaries at home and abroad. The, The largest and greatest evangelical force on the planet. It's something to be excited about. It's something to support and even to take some measure of, I guess, pride in. But... That averages out to less than one missionary for every four churches. Every four of these kind of churches produce, squeeze out, make one missionary? When we know good and well, there's a real heaven, there's a real hell, our citizenship is supposed to be in heaven, we're not, we're supposed to take this world stuff and consider it garbage, and all we can produce is one missionary for every four churches? And there are missionaries that are waiting to go that can't because they don't, they're not being funded. Because we want to spend our money on other things. There are things that are more important to us as as Christian people than sending missionaries to reach the lost. 6,426 unreached people groups. Each one of them could have tens and thousands, millions represented. I thank God for every good thing He did in our lives in in 2010, in my family, in my marriage, and with my kids, and and with our church, and, and with your... I'm so thankful for the good things He did. And yet I want to suggest today that we are nowhere near there yet. As a church, we have a long, long way to go. It's going to require unprecedented sacrifice for us to go where God wants us to be. And and, and more importantly, it's going to require a far deeper level of intimacy with Christ than what many Christian people have ever experienced. They don't even know anything about it. They've, They've never even gone that far. I believe that God wants to give us more than ever and do more for us and through us than He ever has before and more than we could ever imagine. But it starts with connecting with Him intimately and passionately. And the question I would ask you this morning is, do you know Him? Do you really want to know Him better? Do you want to know Him better than anything, anyone you've ever known? That's what it says there in verse 10. I want to know Him. Look at verse 8. Yet indeed, I count all these things for law, as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Then again in verse 10, I want to know Him. Is that your heartbeat this morning? Or did you graduate out of that at some point? Or did you get bored with that? Or did some church kick it out of you and and some hypocrite made you turn on it? Or did, did some experience, some loss? Do you passionately desire to know Christ? I want to know Him. Listen, if you're making New Year's resolutions, why don't you just go ahead and write that one down and put the others on the back burner? I want to know Christ better than I've ever known Him. I want to walk closer to Him and closer with Him than I ever have before. You see, everything that Paul accomplished, everything that he accomplished for Christ was based on his relationship with Christ, his intimate walk with Christ. He was more concerned with connecting to Christ than he was doing things for Christ. Do you hear that? Do you understand that? At the foundational level, our our relationship with Christ is not about what we bring to the table. You don't bring a whole lot to the table, and neither do I. But we, we want to have a relationship, a connection, a fellowship with Him, and even with His people, the church, His bride. Before we get our checklists off of do's and don'ts and, and this and that and the other, everything in Paul's life revolved around his intimate relationship with Christ. I want to know Him. And I think about people that I want to know. I, I don't think it's any secret. I want to know Joe Gibbs. I want to be friends with Joe Gibbs. My whole life I've wanted to know Joe Gibbs. He wrote me a letter once. Didn't hurt my feelings that he misspelled my name badly. But I have it in my office. I'll show it to you. Elizabeth got me a football with a signature on it. I feel like we're buddies now. And I'd love to know him. I'd love to hang out. Not just like, hey, Joe. I mean, I've seen him at several events growing up and just last year. But I want to hang out. I want to have, you know, dinner. I want to be pals, Joe and Pat. And I would love that. I can't tell you how much I would love that. I'd love to know Robert Duvall. I'm intrigued by Robert Duvall. He's my John Wayne. I'd love to know him. I really would. I think it'd be cool to know him, to hang out. Stephen Curtis Chapman. 
Man, that's my musical hero. My brother and I came to Richmond, Virginia in, in, in 1992 and went to a concert and that night changed our lives. Never been the same. God used that, that singer, that artist, to profoundly impact my life. I'd love to hang out with Stephen Curtis Chapman and know him. I'd love to be buddies with him. I don't know who you're... I'm sure we all have a little wish list of who you'd love to be buddies with, you know. But do we really think that some human friendship, even with your spouse, even with your children, as great as that is, I mean, the holidays have hopefully they've been wonderful for you and you've had time together with your family. And it's the best thing this world has to offer. But you know what? God created us with a vacuum in our hearts that only He can fill. And you know what? Even your own family can't fill it. Only He can. Knowing Him, worshiping Him, having relationship. And I would encourage you, make that your New Year's resolution. Make that your starting point. Verse 13, brethren, if I I have not apprehended, I am not there yet. Makes me feel better about us not being there yet when the Apostle Paul says it right here. He admitted that he had a long, long way to go, and so should we. We have plenty of room for improvement as Christians, as church members. As a church, keep reading in verse 13. Forgetting the things that are behind. Forgetting the things that are behind. Now, we said we were going to look forward a little bit, look in our rearview mirror a little bit. Um, let's look in the rearview mirror real quick. And then we have to obey the Word of God, which says, forget it. But before we forget it, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some victories from 2010. This, this was an amazing year in the life of our church. God did things. That I don't know that any one of us would... Who amongst you dream that Kingsland Baptist Church would have a thriving Hispanic church on our property meeting every single week? When did, when did, you, when did that occur to you that God would do that? i I got to tell you, I think it's a miracle. So what, did, what happened? What are the key victories of 2010? We experienced the amazing growth in our church plant, Nueva Esperanza, through the ministry of Pastor Fernando and his family who are with him today. Man, what a blessing. What an unbelievable blessing that God just poured out on us, starting the church in 2009 and then seeing it flourish last year. We started an alternative worship service on on Tuesday nights and then went to Wednesday nights called Awaken, targeting young men and women in their 20s, led by Pastor Derek. We celebrated our 105th birthday in June, and we're still alive and kicking. We marked our fifth anniversary of upward basketball and cheerleading this year. And uh, we're starting our sixth season right now, and we need two more coaches. If you're interested, let me know. Let Ray Cash know. This Saturday, we'll kick off our new season. Pray for Upward. It's been a great ministry. We implemented the fifth and sixth phases of Operation Chesterfield, personally contacting more than 10,000 people with the gospel, whether it was a spoken gospel presentation or gospel literature resulted in, in more than a 1,000 people at, um, at both our block parties this year. We invested $90,000 into missions causes in 2010 through our international offering, our national offering, and our cooperative program giving through our weekly offerings. $90,000, more than one out of every $6 or around one out of every $7 that, that, that God brings to here that we collect does not stay here it goes out. We adopt, adopted the updated Kingsland Baptist Church Constitution back in November and incorporated our church. After more than a decade of work, we got our new constitution and bylaws in line with how we operate today. We mourn in the passing of some wonderful church members who graduated to heaven. Most recently, just, just a couple days ago, I had Jesse went to be with Jesus. And we'll, we'll have her funeral service here at 2 o'clock today. At the same time, we welcomed a bunch of cute little babies. There are a lot of babies, and there's more coming. And on the back of your bulletin is a picture of one of them, uh, Bryson. Where's Bryson? Raise your hand, Bryson. You can see him. I want to meet him after church. And I hear Cheyenne, Adrian and Dean's baby, is coming soon. We conducted four new members classes for 16 families comprising about 35 or 36 new folks into our church. We baptized 20 converts in 2010. God blessed us. He did great things. But 2010 is history. It really is now in the rearview mirror. And if you spend your whole life driving in the rearview mirror, you know what's going to happen. You're going to run off the road or run into somebody. 
And the text tells us to forget the things that are behind. Yes, we celebrate and we praise them. But, verse 12, I press on. Verse 13, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press on. Reliant K saying that song, I'm pressing on. Don't quit. Press on. Don't retreat. Don't back down. Don't get lazy. Don't get comfortable. Keep pressing on. I love Joe Paterno. I don't know anything about Joe Paterno, except the man is 84 years old and he's still coaching Penn State. That's pretty cool. For 44 years or 45 years, this man has coached the same team and he's hung in there and from what I understand, he has every intention of coming back next year and coaching again. That should be an inspiration to all of us, especially for our older folks. Be a Joe Paterno. Show up. Be faithful. Keep pressing on. I love what he said to his boys. They lost yesterday. And he said, boys, keep your heads up. We'll take a couple weeks off and we'll hit, it, we'll hit it up again here in a few weeks and we'll get rolling, get ready for next year. He's pressing on. He's going forward, forgetting those things that are behind and moving forward. Now I want to give you some action items for 2011. You can write these in your notes if you like. And it would be this, press on. Or you could say it this way, strive, agonize, work, endeavor, strain, make an effort. If, if football is important enough for Joe Paterno to keep pouring his life into it at age 84, 45 seasons into it, don't you think that our cause is worthy of us to keep pressing on, even if you're discouraged even if you're tired, even if you're sick, even if you're, you're, you're going through some hardships, listen, don't quit. Keep pressing on. Keep striving. And it's so neat to see even with the little ones. Uh, we took David out to the basketball court a few weeks ago, my little four-year-old, and, and, and we're shooting and, and, and we're having playing basketball and one ball bounces off the rim and David miraculously catches it before it hits the ground. And you should have seen his face. It's like he won the Super Bowl. I caught a ball, Daddy. You were there, John. You saw. He was so excited. He was that excited to catch a basketball before it hit the ground. Man, when did we lose our, our childlike faith and our childlike zeal to keep pressing on? I don't know if God's going to make him a basketball player or anything else, but I know that even at that young age, he wants to press on. He wants to, he wants to achieve. And today, I, I would encourage you, press on, number one, in your private walk with Christ. That's what this text is about. Your time in the Word, your time in prayer, practicing the disciplines. My Sunday school teacher said something like this this morning, you didn't gain 20 pounds from eating an ice cream cone, something like that. It's, it's disciplines, it's every day. It's getting in the Word even when you don't feel like it. It's spending a little more time in it even when you're kind of tired and don't, and don't really want to do it. And spending a little bit more time in prayer, or definitely take time for prayer, and take a stand in your, in, in, at work and pray before you eat, and, and, and practice those disciplines in your life that you need to practice. Find a devotional book at the Christian bookstore and get, get reading and use it. Whatever, whatever works for you, our daily bread or what have you. Secondly, press on in leading others to Christ. Don't get comfortable, don't get casual, don't get satisfied. There's a world full of people that have eternal souls that will live in heaven or hell. And we have been commissioned to take the gospel to them in a variety of forms and fashions. Press on leading others to Christ. Starting with your own family. Starting with your kids. Starting with those who will listen to you. Starting with your, 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 your brothers and your, your, those around you that, that you have a, the strongest relationship to. And sometimes it's the hardest, isn't it? To share the gospel with family. But parents and, and grandparents too, do you not understand how much influence you have on these little ones? Start early and be, be dependable, be consistent and press on. Don't, don't get lazy, don't get tired, don't get negligent when it comes to leading your own kids to Christ. And then sharing your faith everywhere you go, everywhere you can, whether it's picking up one of those tracks in the foyer and giving it to your server at lunch or, or having a conversation with your whoever Talk about Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Press on leading others to Christ. Number three, press on serving Christ. Press on serving Christ. Find ways to serve the Lord. You know, sometimes I look for creative ways to serve the Lord that have nothing to do with Kingsland. Just because you love Jesus. Just because you want to help somebody. Because you want to serve the Lord because you, because you love Him. But, but also, you know, if you're here, God brought you here for a reason. It's a big, big, big job here to do at Kingsland. We need your help. 
He didn't bring you here to just sit and kind of critique like Paul Abdul on American Idol, okay? He's, he's wanting you to, to, to get involved and make things better and to use the gifts that He's given you to get active, to be a participant, press on in serving Christ, find a ministry at Kingsland, or recommit to your area of service. You might think, oh, if i got to change one more diaper in the nursery, I'm going to go crazy. You know what? I would too. I don't know how you do it, honestly. I don't know how you do it. Thank God for people that do that. But we need your help there. We need you to recommit, and we need others to sign up, whether it be the choir or the nursery or Awana or our children's youth uh, programs, van drivers, bus drivers, uh, ushers, greeters. There's a long list of areas where you can use your abilities for the Lord Jesus Christ. Press on serving Christ. It's the, it's the best investment of your life. Other than leading your own family to Christ, and serving them. The best investment of your time and energy is into the kingdom. And God brought you to this little slice of the kingdom. Get involved. Get enthusiastic. And press on. Lastly, press on living out your faith. And this one convicts me. Because you know, at the end of the day, is it real? Do you know Him? And do you, do you have a relationship with Him that has transformed your life? That's one reason we're doing Truth Project. And you saw Transformation. That people that go to church that, that have no idea why they even believe the Bible is the Word of God or any evidence of, as to whether Jesus resurrected or not. They have very few answers to the tough questions. And, 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 and why does God allow evil in the world? What happens when someone asks you that? Oh no, I don't know how to answer. All of my Christianity has just been toppled by one question. You know, why did God allow evil in the world? You, you sign up for Truth Project. You'll be able to answer that question very, very well. I want to encourage you today to press on living out your faith. And I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about faithfulness and humility and loving others. Live out the faith that you possess. Press on toward the goal for the prize. Now I want to combine goal and prize for the purposes of today's message. And just put them together. What's the goal? What's the ultimate prize? Well, for me, it's thinking about heaven. Heaven is real and it's waiting. Heaven in the hereafter. But Christ talked about living life abundantly now. Promised land living on earth. The abundant Christian life. That's the goal. That's the prize. How about the crowns? To to, to kind of bounce back to eternity. What about the crowns and the rewards? Your spiritual inheritance that's waiting for you. That's the goal. That's the prize. Then you come back to now, to, to the present. Rewards and blessings now. Peace and contentment now. The joy that only comes from knowing your children and your grandchildren are following your godly example, walking with Christ. What is more important than that? Are we there yet? Is that happening for you? What needs to change in your life to make that happen? I press... On toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. This is a theme verse for upward basketball and upward cheerleading. It's where they came up with this. This is the high calling of God on our lives. This is what life's all about. The most important thing. God's calling in your life. This text revolves around the concept of knowing Christ and making Him known. Getting connected to Christ and then going out and connecting others with Him. This is our whole purpose in life. This is what makes everything, this is what makes life worth living. Read on in verse 15 and in, the, in, 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 in 16. Two times it says this. Be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. And, and one reason I'm, I'm preaching this sermon this, today is to say, look, this is what we're all about. This is our mindset here. Get in. Buy in. Get enthusiastic. Press on. This is where our unity comes. Be of the same mind. We should be unified behind these goals, this mission. We may not agree on everything. We may not agree on every little preferential issue. But we should be single-minded in our goal to personally connect with Jesus Christ as individuals. I can't connect for Christ for anybody else, even my own family. I have to connect to Christ on my own all the time. And then I desire to help connect others, but they have to make the choice to do so. I pray that we come closer together this year than we ever have before. And I'm I'm very glad to say, looking back in the rearview mirror, we had a lot of harmony and peace and love and all that stuff in 2010. I'm very thankful for that. Problems and schisms and fights hurt. So thank God, it's a very peaceful, wonderful year as a family. But as we move into 2011, we need to understand the enemy is on the attack. There are those whose God is their belly, who, who, is, who take glory in their shame, who are enemies of the cross. They will attack. Are we ready? Are we going to stay unified? Are we going to stay as a family closer than ever, laying aside our preferences, our agendas, our personal agendas, for the sake of the gospel and serving Christ in harmony? God has blessed us this last year. And I believe he's just getting started. 
This is a great time to be alive. This is a great time to be a Christian. I w- there's no time in the history of the world, or in certainly the last 105 years, that I would rather be the pastor at Kingsland Baptist Church. I am ecstatic about pastoring this church today and moving into the new year. Yes, we have tough challenges, but we also have enormous, unprecedented opportunities, and we need all hands on deck. We need everybody single-minded, in harmony, putting up with because in any family you have to put up with with Junior and Uncle Buck and Bobby and Billy and Susie and we every family has difficult people to put up with. Don't be surprised when that happens here. But we love each other more than that, and we're single-minded in our devotion because God has been so faithful, and He's going to carry us into the future. Our job is to press on into 2011, trusting the Lord, growing closer to Him, and serving Him like never before, making unprecedented sacrifices and having unprecedented intimacy with Christ. And my question for you today is, will you commit to pressing on? Will you make that commitment? Would you pray with me? I want to ask you if you'll make that commitment. Will you dedicate your 2011 to the Lord? Will you dedicate yourself, your marriage, your family, your church? You see, I believe God wants to take us to a new place as a church, but we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to try some new things. We're going to have to maybe go back to some old things. Dedicating our church. How about your family? I believe that there there are are children that would would long to just sit by their dad and hear him read the Word of God and pray together. If he would just get off the couch... What about your marriage? Is it possible that your spouse is miserable, not because they're a bad person or they're so far from God or anything like that, but because you checked out? You got lazy. You quit pressing on and you forgot that, man, I need to press on in my married life. I need to press on in my work life. I need to press on in my church life, in my parenting. And just as an individual, will you dedicate yourself to the Lord in 2011? Will you surrender your plans for this year to God Almighty, asking Him to guide and to provide and protect your life and your family and your church in the coming year. And my, 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 my invitation is this. Will you pray this prayer? Oh God, I will press on. By the grace of God, by the enabling and power of the Holy Spirit, I will press on. I will press on. I have a lot of things to pray about today as far as our church goes. We're taking a, um, having a little meeting here in a few minutes. Agreeing on our 2011 budget, that's a big deal. Will you press on when it comes to giving? Presenting new members and new deacons. Will you press on when it comes to supporting those that God has brought in our church that may need help, may need, uh, may need a hand, may need a mentor? Will you press on when it comes to following the leaders that God has brought in to our church that He's ordained here? I will press on. That's my prayer. Oh God, I will press on. I'm encouraging you to make that prayer your own. If you want to come and use the altar today, you may do that. If you want to join our church, man, that, this would be a great day to join Kings on first Sunday of 2011. Come forward. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, see, you can't press on in your own strength. You'll be a complete failure. You may feel that way today, spiritually. Give your heart to Jesus. If you want someone to talk to about that, that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. We'll pray with you. We'll we'll introduce you to Jesus. You can know him. You can know him personally. He'll transform your life. He'll give you reason for living. Give your heart to Jesus today. If you've done that, but you have not been obedient to believer's baptism, I'm not asking if you got sprinkled as a baby. There's nothing in the Bible about that. There's a reason we didn't sprinkle Reagan today. She hasn't made the decision yet to give her heart to Christ. She's covered in innocence right now. But there'll come a day, I pray, when when she gets a little bit older and she realizes her need for Christ and she'll be saved. If you've been saved, but you've not been baptized, I want to encourage you to come forward and let's get 2011 start off obediently, doing things God's way. If you'll just make the commitment, oh God, I will press on for another year for your glory. If you'll give me the strength, if you'll give me the wisdom, if you'll give me the the direction and the help, I will press on. Make that your prayer as we stand. Lord God, we stand in your presence asking for you to move mightily during our invitation. Kingsland Baptist Church will press on for the glory of God. Lord, I pray that you give us 
unity and harmony in that area. We will press on. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come as God leads you. your desire for 2011 to worship and obey our Lord and uh, we're going to call our church into business and uh, if, if you have somewhere to be and, and, and you don't have time it won't be long but if, uh, if we understand if you don't if you uh, can't stay but uh, we will be as brief as possible before we do this I want to uh, introduce a family to you today and this is Wayne and Reagan Lowe and their children who have come forward requesting membership in our church today. And you'll remember that uh, Wayne preached here just a few months ago, and uh, he's a pastor, and uh, God's hand is on his life, and, and we are just thankful that they're here. And, and while they're here for, the, for, for this, um, this time, that, that they'll, they'll be used greatly of the Lord in our church, and um, that we will be uh, praying for him and uh, asking for the Lord to show them, show them where, they, where they will go from here and all that. So please lift up the Lowe family. Uh, when you think about him. And Wayne, I love you and I appreciate you. He's one of our upward basketball coaches. He and I co-coached a team a few years ago, and I learned an awful lot about basketball through that experience. 
So um, the preacher was complaining about his deacons, and I can't stand when preachers do that. But the preacher was complaining to one of his deacons. He said, man, why don't you nudge that guy sitting beside you sleeping all the time? It's ridiculous. And, you know, and, 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 and the preacher, the deacon replied back, you put him to sleep, you should wake him up. <laughs> That's how our deacons meetings go a lot of times. Just kidding. Just kidding. Our deacons meetings are one of the highlight of my month every week. I'm, I'm honored to be able to, to be in there with these godly men. and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prayer meeting and an encouraging time. This, this past year, um, our uh, chairman of deacons was Jim Davis. And he's finished his, his um, term, I guess, if we call it that, uh, at, at, the end of, at the end of December. And, um, but much, much, much was accomplished. And nobody could possibly know how difficult that assignment is. And, and the work these men do and the work in leading them is, is truly, truly, uh, he did an exceptional, exceptional job. And it was a great year. Even in the, in the hard times, it was a great spirit of unity. And, and uh, much was accomplished, including um, a, a, a process that I think he's going to tell you about in some detail. And that was um, by the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, prayerfully and carefully, uh, I guess you could say identifying um, a couple more men that would, would uh, wonderfully and I think very capably fit in to this body. So we are calling, at this point, calling our church into business. We're going to um, do this with the deacons and a couple other things, and then we'll go home, okay? So, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Um, this comes as a recommendation from your deacon body. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, we've uh, completed a very deliberate, a very thorough process in searching for men to serve Kingsland and uh, our Lord as deacons. Uh, that process included very prayerful consideration of a number of men, inviting uh, some of those men to complete a very detailed questionnaire, uh, meeting with those men individually, uh, and finally casting secret ballot votes concerning the recommendation uh, of the men for the office of deacon. The entire process is based on the biblical requirements for deacons and after considerable prayer. And the process uh, resulted in the identification of two men to be added to the present deacon body. Both of these men and their wives have prayerfully considered this step and feel that God is leading them uh, leading the man to become a deacon at Kingston Baptist Church. Both wives have committed their total support to their husband in his service as a deacon. They're already very involved in service here at Kingston and have proven themselves for further service. And just to be sure, uh, some of our newer people uh, may not know these men, I would like for them to stand. Uh, Terry, are you in here with Beth? Come stand by your bride, uh, Beth, if you'll stand with, uh, with Terry. This is Terry and Beth Buckwalter. Uh, we are presenting them this morning. And then Vernon and Janet, are you right here? Vernon Gwaltney and Janet Gwaltney. Uh, these are the two uh, men that we're presenting to you this morning. Thank you. So our recommendation, uh, we recommend Terry Buckwalter and Vernon Gwaltney uh, for your approval uh, as service of deacons, as deacons. Vernon uh, has previously been ordained as a deacon. Uh, the deacon body further recommends, though, that uh, Kingsland Baptist Church uh, plan and conduct an ordination service for Terry Buckwalter in the near future. Pastor, Thank you. recommendation. Mr. Chairman, and uh, this motion coming from a chairman of the committee does not require a uh, second. But we do want to ask, is there any discussion or questions? There being none, if you are affirming uh, this, this recommendation from our godly deacons about these two godly men, would you please uh, raise your right hand? And are there any opposed, like sign? Well, fantastic. The motion carries. God bless you, Vernon. <laughs> Terry. Mary Faggard is going to come and present some names for um, recommendations for new membership in our church. We have three names to be recommended for membership. Russell Krupp, Ashley Krupp, and Jennifer Miller. 
and the we present these for consideration. Thank you, Mary. Can you second that? Thank you, Jim. And uh, are there any discussion about these folks? Ashley Krupp and Russell Krupp. Would you raise your hand so we know where you are? There they are. And uh, Jennifer's here. I know somewhere. There's Jennifer. Okay. All in favor of um, uh, affirming them as members at Kingsland, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Of course not. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Kingsland. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And the Lowe family has been to some of our new members' class, and there's actually another family. So they're, 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 we'll be bringing more folks to you here shortly um, once, once that process is completed. If you want to join Kingsland, come forward and request it. Go through our new members' class, and uh, it'll be done. Hi, my name is Pat Fiorelis. I'm the pastor here at Kingsland Baptist Church, and I want to thank you for being with us um, for our video uh, broadcast of our service. And uh, thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that you will get in contact with us. If there's anything we can do to help you, our phone number is 275-1285. And you can check us out on the web at kingslandbaptist.com. And uh, we want you to know that we love you. Um, uh, a verse in Scripture that means a lot to me um, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it says that the love of Christ compels us, it constrains us, it motivates us. And that's really what we're all about at Kingsland, and that is connecting people with Christ, because the love of Christ compels us to do so. We've received His love, and now we want to share His love all over Chesterfield County. And uh, maybe tonight you have... Uh, questions about your spiritual destiny and whether or not you're on your way to heaven um, ultimately with your life. And I would encourage you to think about that, to pray about that, to talk to God about it. You see, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. He shed His blood for your sins. And uh, the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none who does good. There's none who seeks after God. So the truth about humanity is that we're born, born separated from Christ. We're born lost, and uh, we're really born dead, spiritually speaking. And, and what we need to do is to be born again. That's what Jesus said. You must be born again. And he, he made that possible by dying on the cross for our sins, being buried, and raising from the grave three days later. And um, you know what? That, that, that can become a reality in your life. Tonight, if you want to invite Christ into your life, do that. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Ask Him to be your Lord and your Savior, and give your heart to Jesus. And what we're here to do is to help you, help introduce you to Christ, to connect you with Christ, and to help you grow. And that's why we have our television show every Friday night, and that's why we have services here at Kingsland every Sunday. Um, we have Bible study at 9.30 every Sunday morning, and we have a worship service at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. And we would love for you to come and sing and, and, and learn and, and grow in your faith. If there's anything we can ever do for you, contact us here at Kingsland, 275-1285. And um, we hope to see you soon. God bless you.
Nacional.